Hi! Android 11 is currently in beta, offering a bunch of new features as well as deprecations. I'm sure you are all familiar with the async task class, correct? Just in case you haven't already moved to other solutions for async programming, in Android 11 we've marked this class as deprecated. One of the replacements listed in the documentation is the cryptic Kotlin concurrency utilities which is, of course, Kotlin coroutines. We've recently announced that coroutines are the recommended solution for async code on Android. For some time already, it's been our focus to explore and deliver solutions based on coroutines, in the form of new APIs, samples, code labs, and the documentation. In fact, many people in Android are falling in love with coroutines. But why? I tried to keep the list short, as we are going to discuss some of it in more practical examples. However, the unique properties of coroutines make it especially well-suited for Android. Structured concurrency helps developers scope their work to the application's components lifecycle and prevent memory leaks. Callback-free top-down code is much easier to read and understand. Cancellation support and natural exception handling make a great addition. And finally, many coroutines can run on a single thread, suspending their work instead of blocking, making them fast and lightweight. We believe in coroutines on Android so much that we decided to put them up on our redesigned website as the fourth top reason to adopt Kotlin in your Android app. Check it out if you haven't seen it already. OK, but let's talk about more practical examples. A great API to look at is Work Manager from the Jetpack libraries, because it comes in with all the possible async flavors. The most basic one, simply called Worker, already calls the method in which you do work on a background thread, so you can do blocking operations like reading from a database, uploading to a server, and then writing the result to a database again. At first glance, this code actually doesn't look too bad. It is easy to read and very explicit in what it does. One problem is that we are only allowed to do synchronous requests here. The moment you need to use an async API or parallelize things, it could get really ugly. Another problem is that Work Manager can order to stop the work at any moment. And while we could just add checks to every other line of code, which is not a great solution but it works, Imagine for a minute that a bloat server actually does three long-running operations to complete. How do you pass in this stop signal to it when it's in the middle of doing its work? Clearly, this example leads nowhere, even though it has natural exceptions and easy to read top-down sequential code. OK, let's try something else. Another way of dealing with asynchronous requests are futures, for example, using listenable future from the Huawei library. There is another version of our worker called listenable worker that expects exactly that. So let's try it. Assume we have some background executor of type listening executor service, and we submit some work to it as a lambda and get a listenable future of data back. Now, for chaining the next operations, I look up the correct utility function, transform async, then make it depend on the previous one, submit a lambda again, get listenable future back, it is not ideal. The nice things, we get cancellation and error propagation. What is not so nice? Everything else. Look how difficult it is to find the actual work that I need to do in all that boilerplate code. For completeness, let me mention that there is also an Rx worker available. However, that also comes with drawbacks such as having to learn the RxJava operators, and it simply can't escape the Java programming languages limitations, like having to chain calls, making everything less readable. And finally, we get to coroutine land with the coroutine worker. I assume here that our database and HTTP client provide suspending versions of their APIs, meaning it is suspending calls all the way down. Everything looks sequential and is readable, Cancellation happens more or less automatically, as it was handled by the library authors. Errors propagate naturally, so we could just use a try-catch as in the first example if needed. So did I come here to say coroutines are simple? No, 
I think they are ingenious, elegant, but fairly complex underneath. What we can do as developers is first and foremost educate ourselves, educate our teams. There is great technical documentation for coroutines from JetBrains on the kotlinglang.org website. But we also produced a ton of developer materials recently for using coroutines on Android. Articles, videos, code labs, and samples make it easier to understand what's going on in addition to the documentation. But even then, I believe the whole trick to making coroutines simple for the user, in this case the developer writing application code, is to move the ecosystem forward. We have a huge job to do here by providing the necessary plumbing behind each API and the necessary tools to seamlessly work with coroutines. As in my example, I assumed I have coroutine versions of the APIs I needed, which enabled me to write three lines of code instead of 20. Fortunately, all of that is already happening. We've already started with the most popular Jetpack libraries, with more to come. Going back to our example of reading from the database, let's talk about Room for a bit. Reading from disk, in this case database queries, is a great example of one of those things that you should not do on the main thread. Room is an example of a library that gives you a suspend version of its calls out of the box. Other libraries are already adopting a similar approach, including third-party libraries like Retrofit. What's really nice about this is that this suspend function is main safe, which means that it is safe to call from the main thread or the main dispatcher, as it will not block the thread. The library takes care of moving execution to the background and returning the result. This might not sound like a huge deal, as someone could just make a with context dispatcher.io call inside bmodule scope, but the fact that it is not needed reduces the cognitive load and chance for error from the API's consumer. So make it the library's responsibility and not the caller's. Room does another thing well, and that's not only providing same defaults for the background executor, but also giving you a way to change it. This will not only come useful if you want to share some executor that you already have in your app, but especially when you need to replace the dispatcher for testing. And by the way, Room is a Java library, so it takes executors, but the rule is almost identical to coroutine dispatchers, so naturally, there are methods to translate between them. So if you build your own API, you can do something similar by not hard coding one of the dispatchers into the function call, but rather make it configurable. Usually, you won't be building your API from scratch though. Maybe you have a Java-based library already, or you are trying to adapt a third-party library API service to coroutines. In those cases, there are two options. The first, check if an adapter is available in coroutines for the future type used by the library. There are integrations for Java 8 completable futures, Guava listenable futures, and tasks used by Google Play services. If you don't find an adapter, it's usually really easy to write your own. And this is the second option. Simply use the suspend cancelable coroutine builder function and call the continuation resume or resume with exception methods from a callback. Of course, simple doesn't mean it is not possible to make mistakes, as I learned when I tried to test this code. It turns out I missed one important part. For my API, I should have added a fast path for when the task is already complete at the time of the call. It works almost the same as the previous version, but it might solve certain problems when running this as part of a unit test. For a full solution, I suggest you take a look at the code of any of the adapters in the coroutines library. So I talked a bit about one-shot suspend functions that simply return a result. Let's move on to something even more interesting, flows. In the previous section, I've drawn a parallel between futures and suspend functions. Flow extends this by offering the possibility to model streams of data, not just single values, and it builds upon the foundation of coroutines and suspend functions to inherit some of its best properties, such as cancellation, structured concurrency, exception transparency, and even natural back pressure handling through suspension. 
Going back to our room database with a simple change, I can make it return a flow instead of having a suspend function that returns a single result. Let's switch to Android Studio 4.1 that comes with a new tool that we can use to edit a database live in a running app. It's called the Database Inspector. Here, I have a simple app running, compiled from our room with a view code lab. The view shows a list of words coming from the database. Now, if I go into the inspector and modify a value in the database, the UI updates immediately without restarting the activity or refreshing manually. That's cool. And this wouldn't have been possible as easily with a suspend function. That's because observing a flow lets the app react to changes when the database emits new data. How is that different from other observable streams, such as RxJava? Conceptually, it is not that different, other than having the whole stream processing built on top of the same Cordins foundation that I've mentioned before with all its benefits. OK, then, how is it different from live data? The original code lab code that you can find online uses live data to observe state changes from the UI. Short answer, it makes little difference in this specific case. But the full answer is a bit more complicated, so let's dive into this. Conceptually, live data is a value holder. It always holds a single value that can be written to and read at any moment. What follows from this is that when an observer connects, they will only see the latest value and any new ones, even though there might have been intermediate value changes when the data wasn't observed. What's important is only the current state. A flow doesn't have a value outside of being collected, and it will deliver all the values emitted into it, unless it's configured differently through operators such as Conflate, which is a strategy for dealing with consumers that are slower than the producer. In our sample app situation, the UI doesn't care for any previous states. It is only responsible for showing the latest, so it is fine to use live data. But Flow can be more appropriate in the lower layers of the app, where maybe for other operations you cannot afford to lose some values. The latest Coroutine library version added state flow, which does hold the current value, like live data. The main differences are, of course, that state flow is a flow with all its operators. Live data has other drawbacks, such as only being able to be observed from the main thread. So what's the future for live data? It is too early to say. You could certainly continue using it or try replacing some of its usages with state flow, although that won't currently work directly with data binding, for example. We are exploring this topic and working on recommendations. The best part is that you don't have to pick one over the other, as it's very easy to convert even from regular flows to a live data, and vice versa. Which brings me to another topic. You may know about view model scope, a coroutine scope that is active as long as the view model is alive. Similar to it, we have lifecycle scopes for activities and fragments. So knowing that live data is active when the lifecycle owner is at least started, and that we can convert between flow and live data easily, what is the difference between observing a live data in an activity and collecting a flow when the activity is started? The first one, using flow as live data, cancels the flow collection when there are no active observers, which means when the activity is in the stopped state. The second one uses a pausing dispatcher, which pauses execution when the activity is not started, but only cancels the coroutine when the activity is destroyed. This is stated in the documentation, but it tripped me up when I first used it anyway. If the flow can handle back pressure, that's not a problem. But not all flows are created in the same way. Let's see an example of this. Similar to how you can convert single-shot callbacks APIs to suspend functions, callback flow is a builder function that lets us convert callback or listener-based APIs to a flow. Here, we take Android's location API, which will keep us sending locations while it's active. The source of our data is hot, because new listeners don't trigger the location API init code. 
but our flow is called, which means that the builder block will be executed every time this flow is collected, and a separate instance of the location listener will be installed. If we combine it with the lifecycle scopes posing dispatcher, this will not work as you might expect. When my activity is visible, the collecting coroutine is active and updates the UI, while the producer coroutine that listens for location updates supplies the values. The interesting thing happens when I launch another activity. The current one is not destroyed, and so the collection is not cancelled. However, it goes into a stopped state. So the consumer that is now suspended no longer processes any values. As the flow hasn't been cancelled, the producer coroutine keeps churning in the background, getting locations and putting them into the flow, with no one reading them until I come back to the first activity. This waits CPU and battery, and it could also start filling up the memory if configured improperly with an unbounded buffer. So handle with care and learn how things work underneath if you start building your own flow solutions. There is one more thing that I wanted to mention, and that's shared flow. Next to state flow, this was another highly requested feature for flows to be able to take a flow and share it between multiple subscribers. In the case of our location flow, for example, creating a new flow is not that bad because we are just registering a listener to the location API. However, shared flow is very useful in other situations when the flow is more expensive to create or you want to save resources by sharing it. What's interesting is the while subscribed option, which will free up the upstream producer whenever there are no subscribers. But that's something that is coming in a future coroutines release, and we'll explore more of it when it's ready. These are definitely interesting times in Android development. Did we find the holy grail of async frameworks? Perhaps. With the recent additions like state flow and shared flow, we can see things are still in flux. But that's a good thing. The thoughtful, intentional design by the coroutine authors that responds to concrete use cases is what gave us what we already have a great fit on Android. So if you are designing on an async solution for your next project, give Coroutines a try and let us know what you think. Thanks for watching.